how do we get into this? Because I'm, I'm just now picturing my aunt who's in Denver, who's in her 70s. And I'm just thinking, okay, Marianne, yep. how do we convince her that maybe learning about quantum is important? And how do you first having, start having these conversations? Yeah, there's a lot of, it, it, it's just like picking a university. Different people will get into it for different reasons, right? I mean, there are people who just care about the fact that quantum mechanics is central to modern technology. You know, quantum mechanics, just to back up a little bit, it is the way the world works. It's the replacement for classical mechanics that Isaac Newton came up with in the 1600s. And after Newton came up with classical mechanics, that's what you were tortured with as an undergraduate with pulleys and levers and inclined planes, right? Yes, the basic physics we kind of all learned in high school, which seemed really simple. You've got the gravity, you've got, like you said, the this, yep. the this, and then everything plugs in perfectly. That's right. right. It was clean, crisp, literally the clockwork universe, right? right? That was Newtonian mechanics. And it was so good and so compelling that people thought that's how the world works. And it was, it was not really, Newtonian mechanics is not a specific theory, it's a paradigm, it's a way of doing physics. And it applies whether you're talking about particles or you know, electricity and magnetism, the planets or whatever, you know, the ocean currents. And then in the early 20th century, we began to realize, yeah, it doesn't quite work that way. All the time. It doesn't, yeah, or, and you know, it, it's, it's fundamentally not just you take Newtonian mechanics and tweak it a little bit, Fundamentally, you throw it out and you replace it with something totally different. And that's what quantum mechanics asks us to do. And the central idea that makes quantum mechanics different is that in Newtonian mechanics, you have like, okay, there's a planet going around the sun. You give me where the planet is, how fast it's moving, where the sun is, and I can tell you what it's going to do. And literally people do this on computers, right? They simulate the future of the solar system. Right, and Kepler used to do that in the back Kepler, of the day. Kepler, yeah, Galileo, all, Newton, all, all those people, guys used to Robert watch Polk. it. Yes. And that was all based on Newtonian. Well, Kepler was pre-Newton. Kepler pre -Newton. helped inspire Newton to, right. uh, to figure these things out. Kepler figured out that planets move in ellipses, not in perfect circles. Right. And then Newton said, oh yes, if the law of gravity is the inverse square law, I can predict that planets move on ellipses. So that was his great triumph. Right. But then the difference is in quantum mechanics, uh, if you talk about an electron, for example, okay? In fact, the electron, the, the, there's the classic picture of the atom that we've all seen with yeah. a little nucleus at the middle and the electrons are what look like little planets, almost just like a little solar system, right? right. So that's a very comforting picture. We've seen pictures of the solar system. Here's the atom. They right. look very similar. Perfect circle. It's all happy and perfect. That's and, right. right. And as it turns out, that picture of the atom is complete BS. It's not what atoms really look like. And you know that because an electron zooming around an atom would give off light. All of the light that we see here in this room is from electrons jiggling up and down, emitting radiation. And therefore the electron would spiral into the middle. It would lose energy. It's not a stable configuration. So the answer as to why electrons stay in their atoms is that they're not little particles moving on orbits. They're waves. They're a cloud that is spread out and sort of settles into some minimum energy configuration. So this is, you know, we're talking about now 1910s. People figured this out. If you think about electrons as little clouds, everything's okay. Right. The problem is when you look at an electron, when you shoot an electron through a detector, it, you don't see a big cloud spreading out. You see a particle moving along a line, right? right. And believe it or not, the, the thing that, pe that physicists convinced themselves of in the 1920s was, Here's how to describe reality. When you're not looking at it, the electron is a wave. And then when you look at it, it's a particle. And people like Einstein said, oh, come on. Like, you know, <laughs> even if that's true, that can't be the final answer. Let's, let's try to do better. But people like Niels Bohr and his friends said, no, 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 it, it works. Let's move on. Okay. okay. And there was like a name for that theory that when the you The Copenhagen interpretation of okay. quantum mechanics. And when you observe something, it fundamentally changes it. Which yeah. people understand that concept, but like you said, it feels like it's a. Well, duct what tape do you together. mean? So the question is like, what counts as yeah. observing, right? Does it have to be a person? Yeah. Could it be a cat? <laughs> as Schrodinger famously wondered. Uh, could it be a video camera? Like, what if I don't look at it very closely? Does right. that count? Or if you just look at and it. And the answer is you're not supposed to ask those questions. The answer is quantum mechanics seems to, in the way that we teach it to our students at MIT or Caltech, the act of observation is a primitive fundamental notion. Now that's 
kind of silly and absurd and shouldn't be the final answer. So people like me are trying to do better than that. But that's the mystery. That's the reason why quantum mechanics is difficult to understand because it involves words like measurement and observation that are just not very well defined. <laughs>